thank you very much for the invitation. And I'm very happy to have the chance to give this talk here in um, memory of Krzysztof uh, Kowalski. So we're in, or, in ordinary quantum mechanics, we consider usually a system and an observer, but we don't usually incorporate the observer as part of the system. And that's fine for most purposes. But if you're studying gravity, you have to take into account the fact that the observer gravitates. And even so, you can usually ignore that, at least in an open universe. In an asymptotically flat universe, it's likely not essential to explicitly include an observer in the description, because the observer could be far away from the system, watching from a distance, and then the gravity of the observer can be arbitrarily weak. But in a closed universe, roughly speaking, the fox has nowhere to go. So you might ex expect that the gravity of the observer can't be ignored in a closed universe. But it's conceivable that also happens in some open universes, if the region of space the observer can see is closed, is compact. So I, in the second part of this talk, I'm going to give a concrete example in the city space, where it's important to explicitly include the observer in the description. It's based on this paper, which the co-author has identified. But first I want to discuss what an observer can observe. And in doing this, we're going to need two classic, but not well known, not terribly well known results about quantum field theory, which are in these papers that I've indicated here. And my experience is that the first result, which is particularly elementary, is only at best moderately well known. The second result is actually deeper. And as far as I can see, it's really not well known. I'll tell you later how I came to know about it. So in ordinary quantum field theory without gravity, in a space-time m, you can arbitrarily specify any open set in m and define an algebra of operators in that open set. So for example, the open set, I've drawn an example of what's meant as an open set, the boundary not included, is u. And in this example, unfortunately, in this example, my open set is the domain of dependence of a space like that that I've indicated here with the, uh, not sure what this is like, with the cursor. Now, without gravity, you can arbitrarily specify a U and discuss operators in that open set. But in the presence of gravity, that wouldn't make sense because space time is fluctuating. You can't sensibly talk about a region U unless you have an invariant way to identify which region you're trying to talk about. So you can't, in the same sense, discuss an arbitrary chosen region in space time because you wouldn't know what it is. Now, there are examples where it makes sense to discuss particular regions in space time. For example, in an asymptotically flat world, in the presence of the black hole, you could talk about the region outside the black hole horizon, which you can think of as uh, the region visible to an observer at infinity. So that's an invariantly defined region that makes sense, at least to find the orders in Newton's constant, even when space time fluctuates. And as I said, you can view that as the region visible to an observer at infinity. But as I've remarked, in an open universe like an asymptotically flat space-time with a black hole, we don't expect it's essential to incorporate the observer because the observer could be far away. And so we, we more naturally just define the region outside the black hole horizon without mentioning a particular observer. Now, if we assume the existence of an observer, we can invariantly define various regions in spacetime. For example, suppose the observer carries a clock. We can discuss the observer, so the region visible to the observer prior to two o'clock. So in this picture, the blue curve is the world line of the observer, and this point in the world line registers two o'clock in the observer's clock. And the red region is well, time running vertically and light rays at a 45 pi over two angle to the vertical. The red region is the region of space time visible to the observer up to two o'clock. Or alternatively, we could specify a stated time interval and ask for the region causally accessible to the observer in that time interval, meaning the observer can both see and influence the region. So if we consider the time interval from one o'clock to two o'clock, the region that the, 
the observer can both influence, meaning a signal sent from here can reach that region, and also can see, meaning a single signal sent from here can reach the observer prior to two o'clock. So the red diamond would be the region causally accessible to the observer between one o'clock and two o'clock. So once we have an observer, we can define space-time regions like those. But when we do have an observer, what can the observer actually measure? I'll assume a very simple model in which the observer is described by a time-like world line, and what the observer can measure are simply the quantum fields along the world line. Well, in practice, the observer probably, well, certainly is assumed to have a clock and probably has measuring equipment and has access to operators that act on the measuring equipment, but I won't try to make all that explicit. We just assume that the model is that the observer lives on a world line and can measure the quantum fields along the world line. So that's a rather minimal model of what we might mean by an observer and what an observer can measure, but it raises two immediate questions, which we can answer nicely in the absence of gravity, though in the presence of gravity, things will always be a little bit less clear. One question is, can well-defined operators be defined by smearing a quantum field along a time-like world line? Second question, given the yes answer to this question, since it turns out the answer is yes, what sort of thing is the algebra generated by these operators? So let me elaborate a bit on the first question. So we're accustomed in quantum field theory to talking about things we call local operators, 5x with x as a space-time point. But a local operator isn't really a Hilbert space operator, since acting on a Hilbert space state, it takes us out of Hilbert space. For example, if we're in Minkowski space, and the state is the vacuum state omega, the state obtained by acting on the vacuum with 5x is unnormalizable, because there's a short distance singularity in the two-point function of the operator 5x. And to define the norm of the state, we're trying to evaluate this two-point function on the diagonal where it's infinite. Since the leading short distance singularity of the two-point function is universal, it's also true that 5x produces an unnormalizable state acting on any state psi in any space-time n. So matrix elements of 5x between suitable states, such as Fox space states and the free field theory, make sense. But eigenvectors and eigenvalues of 5x do not make sense. If we could measure 5x, the answer would be one of its eigenvalues. So therefore, 5x, the point x along the world line, isn't an example of what our observer can measure. What are actually measurable are suitable smeared versions of 5x. But let's discuss what smeared versions were. Suppose we're going to smear 5x over a set x, s, a set s, to get a smeared operator, phi sub f, where we integrate over s with some measure mu and some smearing function f of x. If this is going to be a real operator, the smearing function has to be such that the operator product singularity in the two-point function is integrable when smeared in this fashion. For example, smearing will only succeed, so spatial smearing will only succeed if phi has rather low dimension. So spatial smearing, for example, at time zero produces an operator obtained by smearing over spatial coordinates, which I'm writing as x vector, with some smearing function f, and then we get this OPE singularity, 5x times 5x prime, both at time zero, smeared by f of x times f bar of x prime. And in D space dimensions, that's integrable if and only if phi has dimension less than d over 2. So actually, that works in free field theory. So in free field theory, spatial smearing does give operators. In general, however, it doesn't. For example, in QCD, the spatial dimension is 3. The lowest dimension operator is a clock by linear q bar q of dimension 3. And 3 is more than d over 2, which is 3 halves. So in QCD, spatial smearing does not produce any operators. Smearing in Euclidean space is only, in, is only slightly better. If we try to define a smeared operator in, D, in cap, capital D, which is D plus one dimensional Euclidean space, we'll run into the same OPE singularity as before, except we're integrating in one more dimension. 
So this is integral if and only if phi has dimension less than capital P over two. So we've slightly extended the range in which we can define a true operator, but not enough for it to work in QCD, for example. So then how do we get true operators by smearing of local operators? The secret is the Feynman I epsilon. No amount of smearing in space will produce a true operator unless we start with a local operator of very small dimension. But smearing in time turns a local operator of any dimension into a true operator. That's an old result, but I'll pause, pause to explain it a little. In doing so, I'll take the time-like curve to be a straight line in Minkowski space, and I'll only consider the leading OPE singularity. However, neither of these restrictions is important. Subleading OPE singularities and general time-like curves in any space now can be treated similarly. Suppose that at x equals zero, we smear a local operator phi by a smooth function f of t of compact support. If phi has dimension delta, then the leading OPE singularity we run into will be what I've written, an integral over t and t prime of this one over t prime minus t plus i epsilon times the smearing function f of delta, well, smearing function f of t f bar of t prime. There are subleading OPE singularities, finitely many of them, but the i epsilon disposes of them in the same way I'm about to say for the leading one. This integral is obviously well defined for positive epsilon, and we want to show that it remains finite in the limits that epsilon goes to zero. For this, we simply write this function as a derivative of this less singular function with a constant cn. I'm assuming two delta isn't an integer. If two delta is an integer, we need to slightly modify this with a logarithm over here. Then we make this substitution in the OP integral and integrate by part to n times. And there's no boundary terms because the function, smearing functions are assumed to have compact support. So then we replace the in original integral with this one, which for a large enough n is manifestly convergent as epsilon goes to zero. So smearing in time, smearing in space was rather ineffective at producing operators, but smearing in time is always enough, no matter the dimension of the operator. So quantum fields smeared along the observer world line give well-defined operators, and it makes sense to talk about the algebra generated by such operators. We can limit the support of the smearing functions to any interval, say the interval in which the observer's proper time, or the time measured by the observer's clock, is in, is in some specified range. So we can define an algebra associated to any interval on the world line. But what are the algebras that we make this one? In the context of quantum field theory without gravity, this question is answered by a rather deep result that goes back to Borchers and Iraqi in the 60s. Well, originally for quantum fields in Minkowski space, not assumed to be free by Borchers and then a new proof by Iraqi. It was generalized to free field theories in curved space time by Stromeyer. And Stromar and I hope to soon present a version of the theorem for non free theories in curved space time. I found that this theorem is very little known. For example, a citation search for the original papers comes up with a very limited number of citations, and even fewer for the generalization to curved space time. Uh, the only reason I know about it is that I was reading Hobbes' book on local quantum physics, and he said something that to me looked like, sounded like a mistake. And, well, unfortunately, Hogg is no longer with us, so I couldn't ask him, but it occurred to me. Um, I have to apologize for my forgetfulness about names. It occurred to me that I was in touch with one of his old collaborators, now in Brazil, and I hope I'll remember the name uh, shortly. So I asked Hogg's former collaborator about this passage in Hogg's book, and he told me, Actually, it was an implicit allusion to the time like tube theorem. But so there was a mistake in Hogg's book in the sense that he says something you can only understand if you know the time like tube theorem and he hasn't explained the theorem. But it wasn't the mistake I thought he was making. Or I, I could, simply couldn't believe what he was saying. <laughs> 
So what does the time white cube theorem say? Well, first of all, uh, there are slightly different versions of the theorem by Araki and Borchers. I'm going to state the theorem in the form in which it was generalized to curve space-time for free field theories by Stromae. If U is an open set in space-time, its time-like envelope E of U is the smallest set that contains all points you can reach by deforming a time-like curve in U to a family of space of time-like curves. So for example, the light green is an open set, and then in black I've drawn a time-like curve in U. Time is running vertically. And then we consider all deformations of this time-like curve. I'd rather change the color to make this visible. All deformations of this time-like curve to a family of time-like curves. And all the points you can reach by such a deformation make up what's called the time-like envelope of U. I've called it E of U. So I'm not sure how well I've drawn the picture at the top and the bottom, but E of U is meant to be the time-like envelope of U. So the time-like tube theorem asserts that the algebra of operators in U is the same as the algebra of operators in the possibly much larger region E of U. I find this result quite striking. I'll try to give it at least a hint of why it's true, but first I want to explain an implication. Suppose what we're actually interested in is a time-like curve gamma, say one of finite extent that connects two points Q and P. So gamma is meant to be the indicated black curve from Q to P. It's meant to be a curve, although I have to give it some finite thickness so you can see it. We can thicken slight gamma slightly to an open set U, such that the time-like envelope of E is the same as the region to which gamma can be deformed to a time-like curves, usually the same as the region causally accessible to gamma. Uh, I realize, at least on my screen, you can't see the bottom line. The region causally accessible to gamma, or the time-like You can choose U so that the time-like envelope of U is the same as the time-like envelope of gamma and doesn't depend on U, therefore, only on gamma. And then the time-like tube theorem is usually formulated such that the algebra of A of U is the same as the algebra of E of U, but E of U really is the same as E of gamma. So the time-like tube theorem actually applies, implies that you can define an algebra for every portion of the time-like curve. So the, a corollary of the time-like tube theorem is that we can define an algebra for every possibly bounded time-like curve gamma. Now that shouldn't surprise us because I already proved it for you by looking at OPE singularities. And that proof was much more elementary, I would say, than the time-like tube theorem. So it's not that we've proved a major new result, but we've shown a nice consistency between these different results. So it's a pleasing consistency check. More important for our purposes, we've learned the interpretation of the algebra A of gamma of operators supported in the curve gamma. In ordinary quantum field theory, it's the same as the algebra A of E, where E is the space-time region with which gamma is in causal contact. <clears throat> so um, I think we'd have trouble defining this algebra in gravity where the region E is fluctuating, but we can define this one in black. We have trouble defining this one, but we can define this one in gravity, at least in the context of perturbation theory of Newton's constant. So I view this as a substitute for this that's better defined in the presence of gravity. So to summarize, for our purposes, I think what's important is that the algebra of a portion of gamma, or of, of gamma or a portion of the time I curve gamma has two properties. It's operationally more meaningful than the algebra of an open set because it's more directly what an observer living on the world on gamma can measure by local measurements. And it's better to find in the presence of gravity than A of E would appear to be. So it seems like A of gamma is a good substitute in gravity for algebras associated with open sets, which one would consider in the absence of gravity. Now, I want to try to give at least a hint of why the time like tube theorem is true. And for that, I'll explain the classical limit. I won't make a serious effort to explain the quantum arguments. But by explaining the classical limit, I hope to motivate it. Suppose we have a reasonable relativistic wave equation like the Klein Gordon equation. And I'm going to consider 
for the classical case, I could consider a nonlinear equation. But by taking the equation to be linear, I'm closer to what is true quantum mechanically. But I've taken a free field equation. We're given, suppose we're given a solution in one region U, and we want to predict the solution in a larger region E of U. So I, I give two examples. So in these two examples, U is shown in light blue, and E of U includes the purple region as well as the light blue. And time runs vertically in each case. So in, the difference is that in case A, E of U is extended in a space-like direction. In case B, so in case A, U is sort of mostly space-like. In case B, U is mostly time-like. Now, what's true for predicting the solution in the larger region from the re solution in the smaller region is different in the two cases. In the, this case, on the left, you have existence and uniqueness. But in the case on the right, you only have existence. Ah, oh, sorry. You only have uniqueness. I can't believe I made that mistake. I copied the picture a few times in later slides, so I'll have the same mistake in later slides. So, in A, you're given a solution in what you might call a space like tube, and you want to extend it over the space like envelope, which is called the domain of dependence. And in case B, you're given a solution in a time like tube, and you want to extend it over the time like envelope. So the Holmgren uniqueness theorem of partial differential equations says that the extension is unique if it exists in both cases A and B. But existence is a more special result that only holds in case A. In case B, only uniqueness is true. To see that there can't be an existence result in case B, here's a counterexample. So again, U is the um, Time like tube that we'll start with. Um, e of u is the time like envelope. But now I'm assuming that there's a point singularity, for example, a point charge that creates a point singularity. Because of the point singularity, then I consider the solutions, the solution of the equation in the presence of that point singularity. So the solution won't exist in the purple region because. What will be true in the purple region is a solution with the point singularity created, a delta function source created by the point charge. There will be a smooth solution of the equation in the light blue region. So the solution in the light blue region does not, in this example, extend over the purple region. So exist, there, there can be no existence theorem in the case of the time like tube, but there is a uniqueness theorem by Holgren. Now, existence and uniqueness in the case of the space like tube is the basis of much of physics. It says that the solution can be predicted from initial data. Physics is causal. Famously, there's a stronger result where you can take the limit where this space like region is flattened to an initial value surface where you specify only the fields and their first time derivatives. But anyway, being able to predict the future from data in this region is already a statement of causality. So it's the basis of much of physics. By contrast, the uniqueness result with no guarantee of existence in case B is not usually useful at the classical level because in fact, the extension over E of U of a solution in U usually does not exist. And it's very hard to predict when it does. Suppose, however, that we're doing quantum field theory and for simplicity, consider a free field phi with the action I've indicated here. In this case, we can view phi as an operator valued solution of the Klein Gordon equation. The reason I'm limited to free field theory is that technically, if we have a non free theory, the operator valued equation of motion isn't well defined. And it's not true to think of, not valid to think of phi as an operator valued solution of the field equation. But that's actually valid for a free field theory. So if we're studying this quantum field theory on M, the field phi does exist throughout M. So existence of the extension isn't something we have to worry about. And that's the key reason that existence theory, the uniqueness theorem 
will be useful in this problem. Uniqueness without existence, especially when existence is generically not true, is not always very useful. But here, if we're studying a quantum field on, we know that the operator valued solution of the field equation does exist throughout on. And therefore, the existence of the extension is not an issue. But what does uniqueness mean? So I consider the region U and the region E of U. So if we just blindly carry over the quantum physics, the classical statement of Holmgren uniqueness, we would say that the field 5x for x in the region E of U, the larger region, is uniquely determined by 5y for y in the smaller region. As explained by Borchers and Meraki in the early 60s, the quantum meaning of this statement is really 5x for x in E of U is contained in the algebra generated by 5y for y in U, or equivalently, the out operator algebras of the two regions are the same. That's the time I two theorem. So in other words, the time like tube theorem is the quantum version of what you learned from Holmes and uniqueness classically. As I already noted, the theorem was originally proved in Minkowski space. Those proofs were not limited to free field theory. While in curved space time, the presently available proof is for free field theories. One last detail about this. The statement that the field for X in the larger region is uniquely determined by the field in the smaller region cannot be expressed even in free field theory by the equivalence of a formula expressing 5x as a linear function of 5y. A suitable green function to use in that formula does not exist. If it did, it would imply existence of the extension over E of U for every solution 5y on U, and we've seen that in general the extension does not exist. In the ADS EFT correspondence, this problem has been noted in the context of what's called causal wedge reconstruction, also called HKLL reconstruction. In that context, U is a small neighborhood of the conformal boundary. One wants to determine the field in the causal wedge E of U, which usually is the same as the time-like envelope from the field in U. So I've drawn a picture, but it needs a little explanation. The whole picture represents anti dissolute space. But the conformal boundary where the boundary conformal field theory is defined is meant to be this boundary of the picture. Then I've picked a small open set in the boundary, and I've picked a small thickening of it U, which is an open set in the bulk. And the time like tube theorem says that the algebra of the green region is the same as the algebra of the blue region, which is the region causally accessible to the chosen boundary region. And in HKLL or causal wedge reconstruction, you want to construct fields in the green region as function in terms of fields in the blue region. You want to construct fields here in terms of fields here. But you can't really do that by Green's function. You can try to do it, and people do try in the literature. But it's also known in the literature that those formulas are slightly problematical. I think that the time like tube theorem is really a correct formulation of HKR reconstruction. So, this completes what I'll say about what an observer can observe. In the rest of this talk, where I follow a recent paper that I mentioned previously, I'm going to analyze a concrete example of an observer in the closed universe. With cosmological horizons. That's going to be the Sitter space, Vs sub D, which is the maximally symmetric solution of Einstein's equations in D plus one dimensions with a positive cosmological constant. It can be described by this metric tensor explicitly, where R is what's called the radius of curvature. The cosmological constant is basically one minus one over R squared. D omega squared is the metric of a round sphere of D dimensions. A D dimensional round sphere of unit radius. Well, the sphere is compact, so 
The city space in this example of a closed universe, right, is a universe where these spatial sections at, for example, fixed value of this coordinate t are compact. At any given t, the spatial section is a sphere whose radius or time t can be read off from the metric and is given by this formula. So the sphere exponentially grows as t goes to plus infinity or as t goes to minus infinity. The exponential growth for t much bigger than r is actually believed to be a good approximation to what's currently beginning to happen in the real world. In the 70s, Gibbons and Hawking studied the city space as a simple example of a space-time with a cosmological horizon in which an observer cannot see the whole universe. They attached an entropy to the particular horizon. So there's a Penrose diagram that describes the picture. In the Penrose diagram, time runs vertically. Now space is a sphere. The sphere has, let's say, a north pole that I'll put here. Well, maybe I'll call it the south pole. The north pole here. The south pole is put on the left of the diagram. The north pole is put on the right. The horizontal coordinate is the latitude. And then following Penrose, one makes a conformal mapping to put, put the whole picture, make the whole picture compact. So t is plus infinity up here, t is minus infinity down here. And then following Penrose, this is done with a conformal mapping such that light rays are pi over two angles to the vertical. So the diagonal red lines are meant to be indicate light rays. <coughs> the um, diagonal line in this direction is the boundary of what, and consider an observer on the left boundary. The boundary of what the observer can see is this diagonal line, and the observer, boundary of what the observer can influence is this diagonal line. So the green region, well, the green region is the region causally accessible to this observer. Now, given an observer traveling in a geodesic in the city space, coordinates can be chosen to observe the observer is at rest in the south pole of the sphere, and then the world line of the observer is the left boundary of the diagram. And then, with that way of drawing the diagram, and thus for this observer, the causally accessible region to the, to the observer is the green region. So, as I've already said, the observer has past and future horizons, which are the diagonals in the picture. And the green region, which is causally accessible to the observer, is called a static patch for a reason I will explain in a moment. If you continue to Euclidean signature, the city space is simply a d-sphere with a metric that we can get by replacing t by i tau. And in ordinary quantum field theory in the city space, also in semi-classical gravity, there's a natural de Sitter state that I'll call psi ds, with the property that correlation functions in the state can be obtained by analytic continuation from Euclidean signature. Now let H be the generator of one parameter rotation subgroup of the sphere. I want to pick a sort of rank two rotation subgroup that only rotates two coordinates in the Euclidean space in which you would embed the sphere. In Euclidean signature, a two pi rotation is one. When you continue this to the Lorentz signature, it leads to the fact that correlation functions in the state psi ds have a thermal interpretation at the de Sitter temperature t ds, which is 1 over 2 pi r. This result is due to these authors in the um, early, um, sort of mid 70s. A slightly abstract way to describe this interpretation, which came along later in this paper, is that the modular Hamiltonian of the state psi ds for the algebra of observables in the static patch is this one, a multiple of the, of the symmetry generator H. Now, when we go to Lorentz signature, we can pick the one parameter symmetry generator H so that in Lorentz signature, it's a symmetry of this picture. Moving the observer world line forwards in time, and more generally, moving the green region forwards in time, and moving the space-like separated region over here backwards in time. 
In thinking about the experience of the observer, it's common to think of H as a time translation generator because it looks like a time translation symmetry along the observer's world line, and to refer to the H invariant Bloom region as a static patch. What motivates that name is that coordinates can be chosen so that H corresponds to the vector field d by dt, a metric of the static patch and those coordinates are time independent. Thus, the static patch looks time independent to the observer. The sitter space globally is far from being time independent. On the contrary, as I've explained, it has exponential expansion in the past and future. So it wildly fails to be time independent. But as you go into the future, a given observer can only see a small part. And the small part looks time independent to that observer. <clears throat> now, in ordinary quantum field theory, to any open set in any space time, and in particular to the static patch, we would associate an algebra of observables, which I call before curly A of U, where U is the static patch, which in general in quantum field theory is a type 3 von Neumann algebra. That's what's discussed, for example, in the book by Hogg in local quantum physics that I was reading when I blundered into the time like tube theory. Now, I won't unfortunately have time today to explain what's a type 3 von Neumann algebra, but it's an algebra with an infinite amount of quantum entanglement built in, giving an abstract explanation of the fact that entanglement entropy is ultraviolet divergent in quantum field theory, including weakly coupled gravitational fluctuations does not qualitatively change the picture. But what does change the picture is that in a closed universe such as the sitter space, the isometries have to be treated as constraints. So what, so we define naively what I call A0 of U, which is all operators in a region U, which for me will be the static patch. This region here. In the sitter space. But because the sitter space is a closed universe with compact spatial sections. Isometries are not related to conservation laws, like the ABN Hamiltonian that you have in asymptotically flat space time, but instead have to be treated as constraints. The total energy in a closed universe is zero. That means we should replace A0 by its invariant subalgebra, which I call A0H, the subalgebra of operators that commute with H. But that doesn't work. The invariant subalgebra is trivial. Basically, anything that commutes with H can be averaged over all the thermal fluctuations of the sitter space and replaced by its thermal average, a C number. To get a reasonable algebra of observables, we include an observer in the analysis. So, as I said at the beginning, it's in a closed universe that you might think you need to include an observer to get a sensible answer. And that's what's happening to us here. So we include an observer in the analysis. Of course, in principle, an observer should be described by the theory not injected from outside. What it really means to use the language of quantum computing to include an observer is that we consider a code subspace of states in which an observer is present in the static patch. And then we consider operators that can be defined in the low energy effective field theory in this code subspace, though they're not well defined in the whole Hilbert space. Should we be surprised that we need to include the observer in the analysis to get a sensible answer? As we discussed at the outset, in the in ordinary quantum mechanics without gravity, you can consider the observer who studies a quantum system to be external to the system. With gravity included, the observer inevitably gravitates and cannot truly be considered external. However, in an open universe, for example, one that's asymptotically flat, the gravity of the universe of the observer can be negligible. As I've said a few times, it's in a closed universe that it may be impossible to ignore the observer's gravity. And that's precisely the situation we're in here. 
Now I'm going to make a minimal model of the observer, giving the observer a clock with the Hamiltonian that I call Q. Q is H of the observer, the Hamiltonian of the observer. It's physically reasonable to assume the observer's energy is bounded below by zero, so we'll usually assume Q is non-negative, although it might be more physical to give the observer a mass and say that Q is bigger than mc squared. That's more physical, but it won't really affect what I'm going to say. We'll also, however, for contrast, to consider what happens if we don't put a lower bound in the observer's energies. So the effect of including the observer is to modify the Hilbert space by replacing whatever you would have otherwise by what we had otherwise tensored with L2 functions on the half line of positive Q. We likewise extend the algebra from A0 to A1. A0 is the naive algebra, but we include the observer's operators manipulating the clock. The last factor is the type one algebra of all bounded operators on L2 of R plus generated by Q and its conjugate. Finally, the constraint becomes the total Hamiltonian of the quantum fields plus the observer. So the constraint operator that we impose is not just the naive constraint H, but H plus H of the observer. So the cracked algebra of up observable, taking into account the presence of the observer, is obtained with two corrections. First, we extend the algebra. And second, we extend the constraint operator. So the H hat invariant part of the extended algebra is the algebra of observables taking account the presence of the observer. Unlike the previous answer, this answer makes sense. The reason is that once an observer is present, we can gravitationally address any operator to the observer's world line. For any A in A0, the operator A hat gotten by conjugating A by E to the IPH commutes with the constraints. One more operator that commutes with the constraints is Q itself or equivalently minus H. See, the constraint being Q plus H. Q is equivalent to minus H modulo the constraint. So you can include in the algebra either Q or minus H, it doesn't matter. It follows from classic results of Kahn and Takasaki from the 1970s that one, there are no more operators that commute with the constraint, and two, the algebra A that's generated by the operators I've told you about is actually a von Neumann algebra of type K. Now, okay, so the naive algebra was type three, but including gravity in this minimal fashion I've described gives an algebra of type two. Now, why were Kahn and Takasaki interested in this? The reason is that type three binomial algebras are hard to study, type two binomial algebras are easier, and they had this method to construct a type two binomial algebra starting with a type three binomial algebra. Where for H, they took the generator of the module automorphism group. And they found that that was a useful tool for understanding type three algebras. Now, all I'm telling you is that the fact that this class of construction that used by Kahn and Takasaki half a century ago appears spontaneously in this quantum context with gravity in the sitter space. And it leads to a sensible answer for the operator algebra, but it leads to a simpler answer than we have without gravity. Because just as in the work of Kahn, a type two algebra is more manageable than a type three algebra. And the basic reason that a type two algebra is simpler than type three algebra is that it has a trace. A trace is a linear function in the algebra of complex numbers, such that the trace of AB equals the trace of BA. It's not literally the trace in the Hilbert space representation. A type two algebra doesn't have any irreducible representation and it also does not have any representation in which the trace would be finite. But it does have an abstract function with the algebraic property of a trace. And mathematically for Kahn and Takasaki that makes type two algebras more manageable and easier to study. But for my purposes, 
The existence of a trace means that familiar ideas like density matrices and entropies make sense. And so, you see, our algebra A acts on the Hilbert space H, although it's the extended Hilbert space tensor with L2 of R plus. But anyway, the algebra acts on this Hilbert space. If you're given a state in the Hilbert space the algebra acts on, that's a linear function on the algebra. And because the trace exists and it's a non, because the by linear form trace AB is non-degenerate. Given such a linear function, there's an element rho in the algebra that satisfies this relation. Well, technically in general, rho might be an unbounded operator affiliated to the algebra. But anyway, there's a, a rho at least affiliated to the algebra that satisfies this. And that's the usual defining condition for a density matrix in ordinary quantum mechanics. So density matrices exist in the type two context and therefore von Neumann entropies do also. So density matrices and von Neumann algebras, von Neumann entropies are two things that don't exist in ordinary quantum mechanics. Yeah, sorry, ordinary quantum field theory. Yeah, there's no such definition in quantum field theory in the absence of gravity. That's one of the points of Hogg's book was to explain how to think about it instead. The fact that gravity turns the type three algebra into a type two algebra gives an abstract explanation for why entropy is better defined in the presence of gravity than in ordinary quantum field theory. This is a fact that goes back to Beckinson and Hawking. With many exciting modern contributions. I should, however, point out that from a physical point of view, type two entropy is a normalized entropy from which an infinite constant has been subtracted. So all statements made about entropy in this context have an additive or normalization constant in them. There are actually two relevant varieties of type two algebra. We can get either one of them from this construction. If we put no lower bounds on the observer energy, we get what's called an algebra of type two infinity. In such a case, depending on rho, there's no upper bound on the von Neumann entropy. That's appropriate for describing the black hole because the black hole entropy can be arbitrarily big depending on the black hole mass, but not for describing the city space. If we do put a lower bound on the observer en energy, we get an algebra of type 2, 1. The main difference for our purposes today is that in the type 2, 1 algebra, there's a state of maximum possible entropy, which is the maximum mixed state where the density matrix is 1. That is a density matrix because the trace is usually normalized so that the trace of the identity is one. Now, the sitter space is believed to have a state of maximum entropy, namely empty the sitter space with all the entropy in the cosmological horizon. So to get a reasonable model of the sitter space, we should assume that the observer's energy is bounded below, which is a more reasonable assumption anyway. The maximum entropy state is then the one with density matrix one. Density matrix one is the type one analog of the maximum mixed state in ordinary quantum mechanics, in which the density matrix is a multiple of the identity. We can now complain, sorry, compare with some claims made in the past by others. First of all, since the maximum entropy state has row equals one, it has what's called a flat entanglement spectrum meaning that the rainy entropy is defined this way, are independent of the parameter alpha. In fact, they're all zero. Given the assertion that the sitter space has a state of maximum entropy, that's what we should expect. In ordinary quantum mechanics, the maximum entropy state is maximally mixed with a flat entanglement spectrum. The density matrix is a multiple of the identity, all its eigenvalues are equal, and the rainy entropies are independent of alpha. So, well, it's been claimed in the literature that the sitter space has a flat entanglement entropy, sorry, flat entanglement spectrum, and we get that from the type 2 1 picture. Now, suppose the observer makes a measurement with two outcomes corresponding to projection operators pi and 1 minus pi. The probabilities of the two outcomes are trace pi and trace 1 minus pi. 
as shown by Morgan von Neumann and other values, we can do our environmental possible. If the outcome corresponding to pi is observed, then after this measurement, starting with the density before the measurement, I assume that equals one. Then after the measurement, if pi is observed, the density matrix is this. It's two eigenvalues are zero and one over trace pi, so sigma log sigma is this, and the entropy after the observation is minus log of one over trace pi. So the entropy has been reduced by this amount delta sigma by knowing the outcome, and that's related to the probability p of the outcome by the formula that p is the exponential of minus the reduction of the entropy if you know the outcome. On the other hand, it's also claimed that the sitter space has a thermal interpretation, and the probability of a low energy fluctuation, sorry, a low entropy fluctuation of energy E in the static patch then is claimed to be E to the minus beta times E, where beta is the inverse temperature. But since the, on the last page we had that P was E to the minus delta S, Consistency of the two descriptions tell us that e to the minus delta s must be the same as e to the minus beta times e. In other words, the thermal suppression of a fluctuation can be understood as a purely entropic suppression. I think that's surprising, but it's been argued before on other grounds, notably by considering the case that the fluctuation is a small black hole at the center of the static patch. Well, what part of this is surprising? The formula P equals E to the minus delta S for the probability of an outcome isn't really surprising. It's a consequence of claiming that you have a maximum entropy state in which all states are equally likely. If all states are equally likely, the probability of an outcome is just proportional to the number of microstates that are compatible with that outcome. Here I'm using language appropriate from the ordinary quantum system with a finite dimensional Hilbert space. A moment ago, I explained how to reach the same conclusion in the context of the type 2 1 algebra. So the surprise isn't that P equals E to the minus delta S, which we should expect for a state of maximum entropy, but that the maximum entropy state also has a thermal interpretation. Let's discuss how to see this in the context of the type 2 1 algebra. First of all, ignoring the constraint for the moment, the time dependence of an operator A, where I consider real time, is defined by the usual formula that A of t is obtained by conjugating A by e to the value h t for real time t. Then we can consider time dependent correlations. And as shown by Gibbons and Hawking and Ligari, Hedron, and Nafi in the 70s, these correlations have thermal properties that reflect the fact that they can be computed by analytic continuation from Euclidean signature. After imposing the constraint, we replace A with its stressed version, which is this, and then we again define its time dependence, like so. Then, because H annihilates the Vesita state, we rather trivially find that the dressed operators in the state of maximum entropy have the same correlation functions as the undressed operators in the naive dissidus state, ignoring the constraint. So correlators of gravitationally dressed operators after imposing the constraints have the same thermal properties that correlators of bare operators had before imposing the constraints. So weakly coupled gravity does not disturb the thermal interpretation of dissidus space, but it leads to a new interpretation that we did not have without gravity the natural de state is a maximum mixed state of maximum possible entropy. Now, I'm not sure, Professor, when I started, so I don't really know how much time I have, but luckily, I'm essentially at the end. I'll just summarize for a couple minutes. In sum, I've explained a concrete example of including an observer to get a sensible answer in a cosmological model with a closed universe. And at least in the example of the sitter space, I've explained that gravity makes the notion of entropy better defined than it is in ordinary quantum field theory. 
So we were able to discuss the entropy of the static patch as the entropy of the type two algebra. But this has a limitation. This is modular and additive to the normalization constant. So we're missing, it's like classical physics where you can define entropy differences, but in classical physics there's no good definition of the absolute zero of entropy. We're in the same situation here, but the entropies we define this way are defined. I'm sorry about the background noise. I'm trying to wait it out. I don't know if Zoom is filtering it out for you. Anyway. So at least in the example of the city space, I've explained that gravity makes the entropy better defined than it is in quantum field theory without gravity. Something important that's discussed in our paper, which I haven't had time to explain, is that entropy defined this way agrees with generalized gravitational entropy as defined by formulas that go back to back and forth, although there are many mod more modern refinements. Finally, there's actually a similar story for the black hole, but that will have to be left for another occasion. Thank you very much. Thank you for the talk. Are there questions? You essentially uh, get rid of ultraviolet divergences and make uh, and made the entropy finite in a kind of intuitive hand waving way. It's a type of a cutoff, or it's rather you subtract it to infinities and get a finite number. How you would explain intuitively? Well, the renormalization was made when you define entropy for type two one algebra, which I didn't have time to describe. So. The definition of the type 2 1 algebra is actually mathematically rigorous, although I didn't explain it precisely enough to make it mathematically rigorous. It's also true that entropy is mathematically rigorous for type 2 1 algebra. The original paper, I'm at risk of forgetting another name. The original paper goes back to 1962 and is is by uh, Siegel, the same Siegel of the GNS construction. And there's a, actually a paper on entry for type 2 algebra by Roberto Longo and me from last fall. So both the construction of the algebra and the definition of entropy for the algebra are mathematically rigorous. The question is, where was renormalization hidden? So renormalization is hidden in the procedure for uh, defining entropy for the type 2 algebra. Um, so thank you for a nice talk. Uh, I have the following question. So you, you have explained that in a closed universe, something like a de sitter, one needs to take into account the uh, gravitation of the observer. And uh, then uh, in the model, you do take it into account through the constraint, but uh, we, we don't see the uh, uh, gravitational interaction of the observer with the background per se. Is it oh, some kind of approximation, or could you spell out how, how well, it works, I'm, why constraint did, is enough? We did take into account the gravity of the observer, because the reason we have, well, you see, what's different about a non-compact observer? In an open universe, well, let's consider asymptotic as well. You can measure a charge at infinity, for example, electric charge is the integral of the electric field at infinity. And energy is given by the ADM mass. Well, it's integral something at infinity found by ADM. And the ADM mass would include a bunch of things plus the Hamiltonian of the observer. Now, the difference in the closed universe is that there's no surface, there's no surface term because there's no boundary. So there's no analog of HADM 
Instead, there's a constraint. The constraint says that something is zero. And the something is what, if you didn't have gravity, would be the generator of the time translation symmetry. So the operator that would generate the time translation symmetry is what I call it H in the lecture. It generates time translation symmetry for the bulk quantum fields plus the H of the observer. When I impose the constraint H equals zero, I'm imposing the gravitational equation of motion that forces the constraint operator to vanish. The vanishing of the constraint is one of Einstein's equations. And I included the energy of the observer in the Einstein equations. So what it means to take into account the gravity of the observer is to include the Hamiltonian of the observer as a source in Einstein's equations. And that's precisely what we did. Okay, that, thank you. Is that clear? Because otherwise I'd like to... Yeah, if there yeah, is, yeah. Thanks a lot. Okay. Um, any other questions? Yeah. You assumed that Q is positive. So yes. th th then there was L squared of R plus. And yes. then you considered uh, the, uh, the conjugate uh, operator, so the D over DQ. Yes. No, I understand the question. The question is the point. So on L2 of R, uh, P is self, P is self adjoint. But it's not good here. Yeah, this is the question, yes. Yeah. Now, uh, it's, described, it's described more accurately in the paper, but I was, I had to cut a lot of corners in the lecture. I was, con I wanted to consider two cases where we would do or do not impose the lower bound on the observer energy. And the formulas of why I wrote them were correct if we don't impose the lower bound. If we do impose the lower bound, when I wrote E, well, when I actually used P, where I actually used P was in this, when I, when I actually used P, it was in this formula. And if you want, are imposing a lower bound, the correct version of the formula is this, where pi is the projector on Q equal to greater than zero. So everything, if you write the formula this way, you use P as an operator, you use this, this is a unitary operator in the whole Hilbert space, but you project it before and after with pi to get an operator in the smaller Hilbert space. And that operator has all the properties I claimed. So I cut corners by not explaining the correct version of the formula for A hat when Q is assumed to be bounded by. But you're quite right in asking this question. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I, th I think there are no more questions, so let's thank again. Thank you for the invitation.